Hello, and welcome to Films Across Borders, Stories in a Changing World. I'm Nada Malouf, Chief Advancement Officer in the School of Communication at American University. Through our work here at the School of Communication and presentations such as this, we seek to serve the nation and the world as a teaching, training, and research leader in the fields of communication studies, film and media arts, journalism, and public communication. This is our seventh year working in partnership with embassy cultural organizations, arts institutions, and environmental groups, showcasing films about the major issues of our time. Our focus this year of stories in a changing world is especially poignant as we turn our lens on stories of transformation and renewal in all walks of life and across continents. These stories will both inform and inspire us as we forge ahead in what has become a significantly changed and new world for us. Thank you to all of our partners for their collaboration this year. You can see them on the screen now. Let's take a look at the sizzle reel, which provides a glimpse into this year's film series, which you can explore in detail on our website, filmsacrossborders.org. Front Runner tells a heroic story of Dr. Masuda Jalal, the first woman to run for president of Afghanistan. Before her candidacy, she worked as a child advocate defying the murderous Taliban regime and risking her life daily. As the only woman in a field of 17 candidates, her presidential campaign inspired thousands of women across the country to participate in the democratic process. Amidst death threats and bomb attacks, Jalal relentlessly campaigns from the back of a taxi, in mosques, in homes, in busy markets, and in the streets. Her courage shows that it's the dangerous work done by ordinary Afghans, women and men, that will determine the fate of a newly born democracy. While ultimately losing the election to Hamid Karzai, her courageous campaign opened the door for more than 550 women to run for political office just a few months later. Released in 2008 and filmed over a period of four years, this documentary portrays an Afghanistan with hope for a new beginning and a new democracy. Today, almost 17 years later, the country is falling again into the hands of the Taliban and its merciless rule. Let's take a look at the film trailer now. I plan to run for presidency of Afghanistan uh, again and again and again. It doesn't matter if I lose, that is not a failure. I count it success. It is waking up the mentality of leadership of women of Afghanistan. <laughs> Oh 
Kalau merasa tugas dia sudah selesai. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. I don't have a private car, and uh, my friends by turn, they're sending their cars because I'm a presidential candidate, and they say you shouldn't be walking here. Yeah? I didn't have the international community support in emergency law, and I don't have the international community support now, not at all, not political, not diplomatic, not financial, at all. Afghanistan. going and I won't give up. I never give up. I'm committed. We are so pleased to have School of Communication Professor Bridget Marr moderating this conversation. An award-winning documentary filmmaker, Marr focuses on women from women's issues in the Middle East to women's health and beyond. Her most recent project is experimental curator, The Sally Dixon Story, about a little known pioneer in the male dominated art world who transformed experimental cinema by helping film artists make it and the public see and understand it. Mar produced and directed the Mama Sherpas, which was executively produced by Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein, The Business of Being Born. It follows nurse midwives and their patients over two years to give an intimate glimpse of the unique value midwives can bring to childbirth in the hospital system. Mar produced and directed Veiled Voices, bringing to light the complex role of female leaders in contemporary Islam through the stories of three women in Egypt, Syria, and Lebanon. Veiled Voices screened on over 150 public television stations across the US with multiple, nat multiple national satellite broadcasts. It was featured in the Al Jazeera Documentary Film Festival and the Los Angeles Women's International Film Festival and was distributed by Arab Film Distribution. Welcome, Professor Marr. Thank you so much. It's such an incredible honor to be here today. And it's also such an incredible honor to um, be able to moderate these very, very esteemed panelists. I'm going to go ahead and start now with some uh, introductions. Um, we are first joined with the protagonist of the film, uh, Dr. Masuda Jalal. She is the film's protagonist and political activist, medical doctor, three-time presidential candidate, former minister of women's affairs in Afghanistan, and founding president of Jalal Foundation, an NGO that brings together 50 women councils, organizations to promote women advancement through advocacy, service delivery, and capacity building and groundbreaking projects. Jalal became a pediatrician after studying medicine at Kabul Medical University, later teaching there. Forced to resign in 1996 when the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, she was later arrested for her activism, defending women's rights. Released at the intervention of the United Nations, she never left Afghanistan during Taliban rule, instead intensifying her political activism. After the fall of the Taliban in 2002, she became the first woman to run for president of Afghanistan, and again in 2004 and 2019. In 2004, running against Hamid Karzai, she stood sixth out of 17 candidates. Dr. Jalal went on to become Minister of Women's Affairs in Karzai's government for the next two years. We are also honored to have her daughter, uh, Ms. Hasina Jalal, who is a women's rights activist and has worked in leadership positions in the Afghanistan government as policy advisor to the minister and director of donor coordination and program management directorate at the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum. Policy expert and research team leader in the presidential place and director and founder and co-founder of several civil society organization and women's national and regional networks. 
Hasina's efforts and activism for gender equality, human rights, women empowerment, and democracy in Afghanistan has been recognized by several regional and international awards and honors. In 2012, Asian Rural Women's Coalition recognized her efforts with honoring a 100 Asian Women Award. In 2014, she was elected by public vote to receive the End Peace Award from the UNDP Asia Pacific Regional Office and the UN Secretary General Special Advisor on the University of Peace. The Global Women Leadership Award by the CSR and in 2017, she received the World Super Achiever Award by World Human Rights Congress. In 2020, she received the Iconic Women Creating a Better World for All Award by the Women's Economic Forum and the Afghan public voted for her to receive the 45 Most Influential Afghan Women's Award. Virginia Williams, director and producer of Front Runner, is an Emmy Award-winning filmmaker who has written and produced a wide variety of documentary specials and series for the Discovery Channel, TLC, National Geographic, PBS, and other broadcasters. Her company, New View Media, now focuses on producing advocacy, educational, and social impact media, along with social behavior change programming on global health and human rights issues. While working as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, Virginia became interested in the reality versus Western perception of women's roles in Islamic society. Her master's thesis at AU was development for a documentary about the perception of Muslim women by Western society. Oh, my apologies. I'm just realizing here the, uh, I am missing a page of notes here. So just hold on one moment as I improvise my apologies. Um, I just want to say I'm very, very honored um, that uh, Virginia Williams has taken this on and recognized very early on the misconceptions that we have, especially in the media in regards to the Muslim world. So her master's thesis at AU was development for a documentary film about the perception of Muslim women by Western society as perpetuated by the media versus the reality. In June 2000, 2002, she received a research grant from ITVS to investigate a similarly themed film about Afghan women's rights activist role in rebuilding Afghanistan after the Taliban. What she found was hundreds of women had been resisting the Taliban and were ready to keep fighting for a full and equal role in society. After a year developing the story, she learned about Dr. Masuda Jalal during the country's emergency election in 2002. She knew this was a story that would capture the courageous spirit and height of what Afghan women and thousands of them were capable of. Halina Kazem is co-producer and front, run of front runner is an investigative journalist and filmmaker and lecturer in journalism and human rights and at uh, San Jose State University. She is the journalism coordinator and core faculty member of San Jose State University Human Rights Institute. Her work is deeply influenced by feminist theory and perspectives of women and gender. Halima is currently a PhD candidate in feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research is a feminist history of gender, empire, and resistance Afghanistan, and is informed by more than 20 years of working as a journalist, including a decade reporting on the war and rebuilding efforts in Afghanistan. Halima's articles have been published in the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, San Francisco Chronicle, Al Jazeera, and Christian Science Monitor. She worked as human rights researcher for Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and as a journalism instructor for the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. From 2002 to 2014, she trained more than 300 journalists in Afghanistan. And finally, we have Professor Gary Keith Griffin, Director of Photography for Front Runner. He is an award-winning producer and cinematographer whose work also includes Autism is a World, a documentary co-produced with CNN, which tells the story of an autistic woman's path to communication, and Gerrymandering, a film about the unfair le legislative practice of redistricting. Griffin won the Sundance Film Festival's 2005 American Excellence Cinematography Award for his work on The Education of Shelby Knox, the story of a feminist coming of age. Griffin holds an MFA from Prague's FAMU Film Academy of Performing Arts and is a filmmaker in residence um, at the Film and Media Arts uh, Program in American University. So what 
the format is going to be this afternoon is I'm going to ask the esteemed panelists um, a couple, a few questions, and then we will go ahead and open it up to questions from the attendees. So please place your questions in the chat window for review. I'm very conscious of time, and I know that soon to be Dr. Kazem um, is going to leave shortly. So if the uh, panel doesn't mind, I'm just going to start with my question, my question for her. Um, and then I will proceed to um, start with um, filmmaker Virginia Williams. Um, so my question for you um, is, Halima, is what, how did you become involved in this documentary to begin with? Because you definitely play a critical role in the narrative as we watch it and as we watch the story unfold. So I was very curious, you know, were you working in Afghanistan at the time? How did you get to know Virginia? And what was your role as co-producer? Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the forum. And um, it's it's such a wonderful, I, my heart feels um, so happy to see Dr. Jalal's face after such a long time and to see Hasina Jalal um, today. And thank you all for hosting. And Virginia and Gary, uh, it brings back so many memories. We spent so many time, so long together at a time that now we can't even fathom. Like we can't, it was a whole different world. It was a whole different lifetime. It feels like, especially after the last three months. Um, how did we meet? Um, after 9-11, after I was in New York City. I was just finishing up grad school. And I was asked because I was one of the few at the time, Afghan-American journalists who was very active and, and professional to actually go and set up the media office for the car, for the interim administration, for the Karzai administration. And when I got on the ground there, we couldn't even make any phone calls. There was no internet connectivity. We had to use a bulletin board to get uh, notices to journalists about when a press conference would be. Nobody knew how to put together a press conference. So I worked with the person who would later become chief of staff for Karzai um, and later on an ambassador. And we tried to actually create a media office. Um, and so I worked in the prime minister's compound. I was, I think, the first woman to go back and work inside the presidential palace. I remember walking in feeling so intimidated um, into a palace that was just recently um, was just recently under the control of the Taliban. And so it was through these efforts of trying to get hundreds, if not thousands of journalists together for the emergency Lori Jirga that spring of 2002. And that is actually the first time I actually um, saw Dr. Jalal. And I think we had a brief conversation and I think I wrote a story uh, about her. I was still reporting. I always have my reporting hat on. And I think if I remember correctly, it feels so long ago, Virginia contacted me as a possibility to be featured in the film, um, but then, but then we talked about, but then we talked about collaborating. And if my memory serves I me you, right, I think I met I you think... at Hunter College in New York. So I met you there at a like a forum of. Um... <sighs> I can't remember what when it I was. went back to. <laughs> yeah, well, we chatted, and I was like, "Wow, you would be great to partner up with." So that I kind of like ambushed you. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, and so I feel like then we realized it would be great to work together. And then over time, Virginia said, "Would you work through kind of helping narrate the film?" And I and I served that purpose as well as also a co-producer. So it was kind of very organic. And the first time that I saw Dr. Jalal. Um, in the Lloyd Jirga and really understood the impact it was having that she was going to run was incredible, especially considering the time. And then now in hindsight, I'm so eager to hear from her how all of those memories come together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so my next question is for Director Williams. You know, in your um, biography, there's a mention to you're interested in um, addressing uh, misconceptions about the Muslim world. And then you spent a year researching uh, the women's um, leadership positions in Afghanistan. But can you share a little bit more about how you came to the story and what inspired you to begin making this documentary? And then just as a follow-up, how long did it take and how long were you on the ground in Afghanistan? Sure. Well, I'm, as well, I'm just overwhelmed with, um, you know, gratitude for being here and seeing everyone again. It's, it's, uh, it's great. We had a little 
five minute reunion before this call. So, um, and thank you for offering the film uh, to people to see now. Um, I, uh, you know, I was working in television. I was making these uh, films and, um, you know, kind of doing my own thing. I had, um, I had an interest in, um, this is a particular topic just you know, by virtue of the fact I was in the Peace Corps in Morocco and um, what I, my experience with the women I met there and, you know, I had not really had a lot of experience living in a um, predominantly Muslim country. So um, that was where I, I kind of got started um, with my interest level. And I just, my experience was much different than what was portrayed uh, through the media. And I've always had an interest in um, the media in general and how it influences, um, you know, public perception and um, social norms, etc. So, so that was where it started. And I, um, you know, after 9-11, I was, uh, you know, I just heard many stories about what was happening in Afghanistan. And I wanted to find out more about what, what the women were doing, what they had been doing during this whole regime um, and and how they were living and and I wanted to give them an opportunity to 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 speak um, and that was one of the reasons I you know I didn't make the film narrated per se I mean Halima she she guides it along but for the most part um, it's it's self narrated um, sort of they used to call it cinema verite and um, so that's how that's how it started, and um, it sort of went on from there. I, I I got a grant, a small grant, for my TBS, and then I went to Afghanistan with a photographer. He was actually a still photographer. He became a videographer, <laughs> um, and I I did a lot of investigation um, of finding out uh, who is who and meeting a lot of wonderful women. Um, and men, and uh, and then I put together a trailer and managed to to cobble together some funding from the MacArthur Foundation and from the Tides Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. So I did get some money together, which was great. I, that was a part of the process that was not my. I didn't feel like it was my forte. I just wanted to make the film, you know. Um, and that's that's a huge, uh, you know, that was a huge factor in how to. But, you know, we got there. It took seven years, which is typical for an independent film. Um, I think that's the average, actually. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm so glad we, we did it. We pulled through. And I'm, I'm very grateful to Dr. Jalal and her family for putting up with us, with, you know, nosing the camera in her face and, you know, for saying yes. I mean, she was, she was a bit cautious when, when I asked her. Um, and rightly so, you know, you got to be careful about who, who you're talking to. And, but I'm so glad she put our trust in us and, and uh, we were able to capture that part of history and her, her create courageous um, accomplishment. You know, I don't see it as a failure of her, you know, coming in six and 17 candidates that who are men, I think it's a major success. And um, even now, it means a lot, you know, it, it, it means so much as far as where uh, Afghanistan can go and is still, so. Thank you so much. That was really inspiring. Um, having lived in uh, Morocco, um, I can really identify with, with oh, your story wow. and how you Yeah, shared. we have a little bit in common there. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so my next question is for Dr. Jalal. Again, such an honor to um, be able to interview you today. I know that the filmmaking process can often be very intrusive and you are already in a position of taking great risk to yourself and your family through running for office. What were some of the concerns that you had while filming and running for president? And what were some of the challenges that you faced while making and participating in the documentary that were unique to you being filmed 
while you're on this critical journey? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet uh, my old friends, uh, Miss uh, uh, Virginia Williams and uh, Miss uh, uh, Halima Kazem. And uh, so glad to be here in this uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, so thank you for your question also. Uh, well, um, at that time, it was completely uh, different um, the situation in Afghanistan. International community came in and uh, they provided um, uh, people of Afghanistan with democratic uh, opportunities. And um, so taking privilege of those opportunities uh, that uh, uh, was announced at that time, that uh, each and every citizen uh, within eligible within the requirements um, that uh, were, were there at that time uh, can become uh, men and women can become a candidate for presidential election. So I uh, used that opportunity and I had uh, a lot of work uh, done um, beforehand with uh, different communities in different provinces and different parts of Afghanistan. So I had uh, enough uh, popularity and uh, enough support from the community. So um, when I became uh, decided to become a presidential candidate, I uh, had the feeling that uh, I could win. Because uh, at that time, the, um, the leaders that people, uh, people knew them, uh, they they had some negative uh, you know, work done in Afghanistan, uh, like uh, they were involved in uh, war and bloodshed and destruction of the country. So um, if uh, their followers and their groups uh, liked them, but the rest of the people didn't like them. So that gave me further courage that uh, um, all people of Afghanistan uh, would not support them. So that uh, might be a reason for them not to be succeeded. So in this scenario that uh, I didn't have those uh, and, and negative and negativities that they had um, within the public thoughts. Uh, so I thought that I might be the winner. So I came forward uh, taking all the risk um, and uh, coming to the political scenario of Afghanistan uh, to be a presidential candidate with the hope and with the strong feeling of winning. So I, it was, a, it was not uh, an easy time as uh, Ms. Halima Kazem said. Uh, I mean, it was difficult. We are just after uh, the Taliban regime and uh, all the world knows and you know how Taliban regime is looking like. And uh, for the second time they have put into that test and we can, we can see them that um, how they are and how they are um, against women. So being in a country, in a uh, war zone, uh, in a country with um, three decades of war already and conflict and bloodshed and destruction and uh, becoming a, a female presidential candidate representing uh, women and people of Afghanistan. So it was not uh, an easy decision to make. Uh, but uh, I did it because uh, I wanted to serve my people in a broader um, uh, circle. Um, I was doing uh, service to my people as a doctor, as a lecturer in the university, and also as a um, uh, aid worker in the United Nations in the leadership of women's and health program. But um, being with people, I was um, thinking and feeling that uh, it was not enough. Uh, the, the people um, problems uh, made me to start thinking of the um, serving people of Afghanistan, particularly women and children in a, um, a very broad um, uh, circle with a broad based um, a spectrum of service that could impact um, all people of Afghanistan at, and can bring a positive change to the life of the uh, people in the country. So my intention was to become the leader of the country. And my intention was to really take the, the opportunity of international community support uh, to, uh, uh, to transfer the power to people of Afghanistan and bring a positive change, changes to their lives. So, but um, that didn't happen. I couldn't succeed. Uh, this would, uh, I had a very clean intention 
but uh, didn't succeed. And the reason, the main reason was that many candidates were national actors of the countries in the region or other countries. And they had uh, lots of support of those countries, including lots of money that they were using during election. But uh, with me as a woman uh, candidate, I, I had my own savings from my own salaries and my own uh, uh, personal, personal, I mean, uh, using personal resources for the for Afghan democracy and for promotion of women's rights. Although I was not succeeded, but as uh, Miss um, Virginia Williams said, that uh, it was uh, full of meaning and it was uh, full of success as it opened the gate to all women of Afghanistan to come forward and take use of the opportunities that Afghan democracy created for them with the support of international community. And it resulted at that time, people were thinking that um, uh, a woman uh, would not come to the parliament and fill the seats uh, in the parliament and uh, would not come to the pro provincial councils uh, in, into the electoral processes. Even the um, uh, analyst and the uh, um, uh, election commission uh, was thinking at that time and expecting that those seats uh, uh, would have uh, remained uh, empty. But uh, my campaign throughout Afghanistan, uh, as part of it, um, was filmed by Miss um, Virginia Williams, and uh, uh, this front runner uh, movie was produced. Um, it impacted uh, the the women's Afghan women's uh, mentality for their leadership and for their um, uh, political participation. So I'm uh, satisfied with the result, positive result that it created for uh, women political participation in the country and for the great service that was made uh, for the um, democracy of Afghanistan. Thank you so much. So just so that everybody knows, I'm just gonna go to each of the esteemed panelists um, and ask some questions and then I'll circle back around. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Williams just uh, shared with us that you had over 100,000 votes. So although it was not necessarily the success that you and so many people had hoped for, you know, working against all that adversity, especially given that outside actors definitely can add the financial um, aspects of boosting up candidates. It's, it's, you really inspired so many women to then, you know, run for parliament. My next question is for your daughter. Uh, Ms. Hasina Jalal, what was it like to um, be in the household while your mother um, was such, and continues to be, but at the time of the filming, such a visible figure? And how did the making of the documentary and her running for office inspire your future work? And what was it like just to be in that household while all of that was happening? Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bridget. Um, I'm very uh, honored and pleased uh, to see um, uh, Virginia and, and Halima and Gary and um, be here um, uh, with you. Um, uh, my early memories of childhood uh, is from uh, when the Taliban regime came into power and um, I was ready to go to school, but just like um, many Afghan girls, um, I was uh, prohibited. Um, and um, fortunately, as my parents were educated, I was homeschooled, uh, but it was a big question uh, always um, uh, for me and for other girls that lived in our neighborhood that why the boys are going to school and uh, getting um, uh, free mobility and, um, we have to wear certain types of clothes. So Taliban regime, during the Taliban regime, the, the, um, my memories are very dark. We didn't have electricity when the world wa was having internet and, and TV and technology. And um, we, uh, my parents, uh, they were uh, jailed and tortured by the, uh, uh, the agency of promotion of virtue and elimination of vice of the Taliban. I was personally, not only I was not able to go to school, but also uh, chased by the mor morality police of the Taliban uh, regime a couple of times for uh, not wearing um, uh, the kind of clothes that they thought was um, necessary for women and girls. And I was uh, only less than 10 years old. So now looking back, I am um, wondering what, um, 
uh, kind of clothes they were expecting. But so that was a very, very dark um, time. And, and my parents had the opportunity to leave Afghanistan, especially after my mother, who was at the time working for UN, uh, WFP, um, uh, she was uh, jailed by the um, uh, head of the Taliban regime at that time, and uh, the UN headquarters uh, released her and uh, invited her to Australia to, to um, uh, live there, but she chose to uh, continue living and um, in, a, in a way um, talk with the, with the Taliban government that we will work from home or we will, you know, um, uh, be uh, align our work with your expectations, but she chose to stay and that had an impact on us that we had to um, be in Afghanistan. So, so in 2001, when um, the US forces and international community need, need to came to Afghanistan, uh, for me personally, it was a celebration um, because um, all of a sudden um, there was no morality police. I was very scared of the morality police. They had a um, specific um, uh, alarm when they were uh, going around the blocks and, and uh, places. So we could hear it. And whenever as children, we hear, heard it, we would run to our houses. They're very fearful of seeing them and that morality police. But that was gone. And instead, American soldiers and an international community, um, a new government. I remember going with my mother to the Grand Assembly when she got elected um, with the highest votes from Kabul um, and uh, being part of um, uh, that. And so it was a, a it was a good memory. And um, growing up in a political environment in my early days uh, was challenging because my parents didn't have uh, close relatives in Afghanistan. Most of my mother's side uh, flee to uh, European countries in, in the um, early uh, war in Afghanistan, during early war, and my father's side were killed uh, during the war. So they didn't have any brothers or, or sisters in Afghanistan that they could uh, trust and um, have the children with them we only have one or had one uh, further uh, relative uh, that uh, she used to help us when my parents used to go for campaigns especially provincial campaigns so uh, um, the main responsibility of uh, taking care of my siblings was uh, left to me and um, uh, I was really uh, young, although I had that help, but it was very challenging, especially when I had to talk uh, when my father, every time they they, go, they would go to the campaigns, he would come to me and talk about, uh, you know, if they don't come back, um, what do I need to do? Uh, he would uh, tell me who to contact and uh, where to go. And uh, he would give me the titles of his only house that uh, he still um, owns. Um, the only house that he sell. So, so all of that was very um, uh, uh, was a responsibility that sensitized me to how uh, politic personal is political and how the politics of the country can uh, change and shape um, um, your uh, lives for girls like me and and a lot of my friends. And um, it was um, it also uh, uh, kind of pushed me to grow up very early and uh, become uh, responsible um, uh, in a very early age. Um, so those were the, the early memories that I have from that time. Incredible, incredible. I'm just so um, inspired by the strength to be so young and then effectively be told if anything happens, this is, you're in charge, wow. Um, I know that Wahidi has a question, however, I. Um, want to actually ask uh, Professor Griffin a question first before, and then I'll go to Wahidi's question. Um, Professor Griffin, you know, having filmed um, in the Middle East in particular, or the Levantine region, um, you know, I found um, uh, multiple times, I find that navigating access with a camera can um, be met with hesitation, especially as an American, what are your intentions? You know, who are you? Do you have any cultural knowledge? Do you know anything about Islam or the pluralism? Um, that is part of um, not only the Islamic world, but the faith. Um, what were some of the uh, kind of high points of being able to work and film there? And then what were some of the obstacles that you faced while um, working with uh, Ms. Williams and capturing the story, because your cinematography as always is gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. Um, wow, that's an interesting question. Um, 
first of all, I had to say that you know, I've been in a lot of places and filmed a lot of things, a lot of events. And what you want to be able to do as, it's interesting because what you want to be able to do as Cameron, this is like sort of sidebar, which is what I've done for the past 50 years, is you want to support the people that you think are doing the right things, which is what Virginia and Masuda and uh, Hasina and uh, Halima John were, were doing. It's a tough, tough job to make a, an independent film. It's really hard. And it's really hard work on all levels. And so when you have the opportunity, you want to actually make, you want to put yourself there to help them out to move things forward. Because I came along at the time when you thought that what we do as media makers was to help change the world and to indeed to help improve and promote democracy. So, so that's one thing. That's like, that's kind of the mo yeah, my motto, really, if you think about it. The other is, fortunately, Virginia and uh, Halima John and, and made a relationship with the Jalals and with Afghanistan. And so my job was to be able to follow up on that relationship. And I've made a lot of films and I know that you can't really do both. You shouldn't do both camera and you shouldn't direct at the same time because you always wanna put the camera down and start talking to people, <laughs> which you can't. And so I get to be kind of the second part of the director, I get to kind of share what his or her feelings are about the person and really to really to feel what the people are feeling. Because to be a successful documentary camera person, you have to involve yourself with the people. And when you have access like that, then you just feel and you go with them and you know who they are. And people around the world are the same. They want the same things. They care about the same thing. They care about each other. And what you, you do is you just, you know, you, you don't impose your vision upon them. They impose their vision upon you in, a, in an interesting way. You feel them. And so that's part of what you must do is you must engage with them. And as part of that, you're doing your job to help support what the film is all about. One, one interesting little trick that we did do was um, we had a, a lovely sound man, John, who also acted as second camera. And we had a, we had a little camera. And sometimes we would send John out into the crowd to draw the crowd to his camera so that I could then go to film something <laughs> with my camera. And there are numerous instances where we played, played this little game where we would send John out. And he was very tall too, so he would like attracted the crowd. And then I could sort of sneak in and, and film something else. So we became used to the fact that, you know, you're, you're, with the camera on the streets and you're pretty obvious. So how do you work around that and still do what you want? And um, yeah, you know. You, you, As a director, Gary, I had no idea that was the ploy. <laughs> so much for me knowing what was going on. We used to do that all the time, it was great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I mean, I think definitely, you know, being a cinematographer telling a women oriented story, um, you know, you navigated cinema, you know, from cinematically um, extraordinarily well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, Dr. Jalal, I'm going to ask the question that was posed in the Q&A. Um, Wahidi says, greetings and many thanks for this informative webinar. Now that women activists are suppressed and many fleeing the country, uh, how do you see the future of women in Afghanistan and what tools will you use to help them? And is there any hope?
I think you have to um, turn your mute off. My apologies. Uh, during the uh, negotiation in Doha, uh, Taliban promised that um, uh, they uh, they would respect uh, the women's rights in Afghanistan and girls' education. Yeah, but uh, when they came uh, in power uh, in the middle of August this year, uh, they uh, didn't keep to their promises. Uh, they stopped women from uh, working and also the girls from education. Uh, so, um, uh, as you see that um, the situation is um, uh, very bad for women and also for the media. Uh, 150 uh, media centers um, got closed and media went under uh, severe scrutiny and um, with protesters, um, they, they behaved very badly. Uh, they they tortured the pro uh, the protesters and uh, so as you hear from the media it is uh, not a good news for uh, Afghanistan women uh, they suffer and um, uh, also um, uh, for the for the future it is completely unpredictable uh, if it is going like this and uh, there is no positive intervention uh, happens uh, from international community um, to uh, to condition. Um, the, the aid and the recognition uh, for um, women's rights and all other constitutional rights and civil rights of uh, people. So um, uh, it is not a good news to all people of Afghanistan. Everybody is escaping from Afghanistan, as you, you can see it uh, through media, that uh, 3.5 million Afghans are already displaced and um, 500,000 Afghans uh, flee to uh, outside Afghanistan. Um, so uh, the future, um, the future uh, is uncertain. The future is uh, unpredictable, and the situation generally is changing very rapidly. So I think that the uh, United Nations and international community um, they should uh, have intervention to to stop this. This is the century of uh, twenty one, and uh, people at this part of the world uh, they. They are enjoying uh, science and technology um, uh, and other advances of modernism into their lives, but Afghanistan cannot go backwards, uh, backwards to enslave further the woman to be able to live. So I hope that uh, this is ended and um, uh, United Nations and international community uh, can take um, concrete actions to, to stop um, uh, discrimination to stop violence and to stop all sorts of violations against women of Afghanistan. And uh, our constitution um, was accepted by people of Afghanistan and by international community. So our constitution, um, uh, the Taliban can take use of our constitution and uh, can uh, uh, can lead Afghanistan within the frame of uh, Afghan constitution. Uh, to the right way. And if they are not able, uh, I mean, uh, they should confess this and they should uh, ask international community to help them for an international conference uh, or for a national grand assembly uh, that the uh, people of Afghanistan, uh, the representatives of different provinces and different uh, section of the society come together and make a decision for inclusive government. And the inclusive government can take forward Afghanistan to the right path. Thank you so much. I'm conscious of time as we have 10 more minutes. And so Dr. Jalal, um, if you don't mind, I have a follow-up question for both you and um, your daughter, Ms. Hasina Jalal. Um, you know, having co-produced a documentary, Afghan Dreams, um, uh, probably about a decade ago, I know that we were unable to screen the film in Afghanistan just out of the safety for the uh, women students who were involved. And, from uh, Director Williams, um, I found out that um, she wasn't, you weren't able to screen the documentary in Afghanistan. Um, was that disappointing for you? Um, do you think that having it distributed in Afghanistan would have maybe changed the tide or changed the um, tone? Um, and then a separate but related question as a follow-up is what's next for you given what has happened? Um, in Afghanistan, you know, definitely before 
mid-August. I mean, it was it was we, we could predict what was going to happen, but um, what is next for you and what is going to be your role? And also for, for Hasina, what is gonna be your role as uh, women leaders uh, in Afghanistan in the future? So it's a bit of a two-parter, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, well, uh, I hope that um, with the support of United Nations and international community, the inclusive government is coming and power can be transferred in a peaceful way to the inclusive government. And I would like to uh, continue uh, serving to people of Afghanistan, to Afghan democracy, to women's rights, human rights, and um, uh, to serve within the Afghan constitution in the political leadership of the country. So if the inclusive government is coming, otherwise there is no trust on Taliban. So we are, I am living now in uh, exile and I am forced to be, uh, to be living in exile, to be coming out of the country. So many hardships in Afghanistan, I suffered, but I didn't come out. 57 years of my life, I stayed there. 43 years of this life was inside war and conflict, but I stayed there and I helped there and I um, uh, preferred and made a choice to be there um, together with my people. I have never le uh, left my people alone. And still I don't want them to, I, I don't want to leave them alone with those pain, uh, suffering and hardships. I want to be among them and I want the inclusive government to come and I want to be uh, serving at the political leadership of the country. Thank you. And um, Hasina, how has your role evolved given the recent um, circumstances? What do you see your role in the future? Yeah, first of all, I'm surprised that um, it has not been screened in Afghanistan. I think it would have um, given a, a, a different um, uh, perspective uh, to the people looking back how things were because the documentary is a very um, is very uh, much reflective of the the socio-economic and political situation of the time and how uh, one woman's courage and a decision to run for presidency uh, impacts the country uh, after Dr. Jalal's run um, in the constitution of Afghanistan, uh, there was uh, during the draft of the constitution, there was debate if um, women should be given uh, the right to run for presidency. Um, uh, but because Dr. Jalal had already exercised that right, um, they were left with no choice but to give the woman of Afghanistan with that right. Uh, also, uh, approximately 550 parliamentary uh, women ran for the parliament after her run for presidency. And uh, women who went to different provinces, they used to come to our house and tell Dr. Jalal that when we go to these provinces, people um, think that it's you who has come here. So they say that Masuda Jalal has come for campaign. Uh, come on, let's gather, let's go. So they, they, they were very much appreciative of that support. And um, that's, that's very important that we, uh, it should have been uh, screened. And I, I hope that we are able to um, screen it now, um, virtually at least, um, uh, and show to people of Afghanistan. Um, my role, uh, my current and future role, I'm very, very much hoping uh, that I will uh, be able to um, serve my country and my people, uh, the country that has given me everything that I have today, uh, my identity, my um, uh, education, um, um, uh, and uh, and uh, the sense of community, and um, and all of that. Growing up, I uh, feel very strong ties with my roots in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, after I came to um, after I came as a Fulbright scholar to the U.S. to pursue grad school. I was ready to go back. The Fulbright Agency um, booked my ticket and I was going to Kabul in the May of 2021. Uh, but the, if, uh, the events um, evolved in a way that it was not, it was, would have been very naive of me uh, to go. Um, and so I stayed. Um, I am doing what I can right now, um, uh, going, uh, continuing my education to further um, empower myself to be able to do what I want to do in the future. I'm going to Georgetown now. And also in the interpersonal level, as well as publicly, I am uh, involved 
in advocacy and lobby efforts um, for the freedom of my country, for peace and for democracy, because I don't think that although the Taliban de facto regime is claiming that Afghanistan is free now and it's peaceful, but I personally don't believe uh, because if it's peaceful, why on daily basis we see um, uh, armed conflict going on and, and blasts and attacks going on? Uh, and if it is uh, free, where is the uh, more than 50% of Afghan women, youth and girls? Uh, freedom for whom? For, for just uh, um, a, a tight uh, circle of formal rebels who are now in power um, and uh, they are um, uh, kind of ruling the country. So I think uh, real freedom will will come uh, when uh, all Afghans see themselves uh, in the uh, in the um, reconstruction of their country and in the future of their country. And I think uh, the, the peace dialogue should should uh, be ongoing and um, uh, the, the UN should facilitate uh, both peace uh, the, the dialogue between um, Afghans and, uh, and the and Taliban and the former um, government officials, as, as well as the political leaders, um, and also uh, civil society needs to be uh, get involved more. Uh, they should be protected so that they are involved in the aid distribution and human rights violations should be uh, monitored uh, very closely because we don't have um, uh, any information about what's going on in the rural areas. Um, and most, most importantly, UN should not uh, give political legitimacy to the current de facto regime because uh, it should be conditionalized and aid and development response should be conditionalized. So this is what we want. And I am doing what I can at my um, capacity uh, to uh, work uh, for the freedom and, uh, and, and uh, peace in my country. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. And then also just the work that you have continued to um, embark upon even from uh, the United States. And you're well situated with your education at Georgetown, of course. Um, so I just uh, wanna say in closing, it was again, an honor to moderate the panel. Uh, Dr. Masuda Jalal, thank you so much. And to Allah, things will improve in the country in the future and that this film will be well screened as an inspiration for women to continue their struggle towards equality in Afghanistan. Um, Ms. Hazina Jalal, um, very inspiring. Thank you so much for the work that you continue to do. Uh, Professor Griffin, as always, lovely to see you. We'll have to have the conversation about director and cinematographer, but we'll save that for later. But as always, brilliant. And then such a pleasure to uh, meet you, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, your, your film was so inspiring. You had such incredible access um, to the family and just really portrayed um, you know, the story with such incredible sensitivity. Um, and empathy that really contributed to having it resonate and be very, very powerful. So thank you. So on behalf of School of Communication at American University, thank you so much for all of your willingness to discuss this uh, not only important subject, but equally important film uh, today with all of us. So thank you. And I will hand it back to uh, the staff and Matt to, uh, uh, and the discussion for today. Thank you, everybody. Uh, wish you all uh, the best, good health, and uh, so much gratitude to all the panelists. And Bridget, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, conversation, for moderating the conversation. It was really terrific. And <clears throat> it, it has been recorded. So please, uh, you know, if, if anybody's interested in watching, there will be a recording available. Uh, anybody who was not able to attend today. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all. Goodbye.